name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. In this stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Psalm 54. Behold, God is my helper. He will return the evil to my enemies. In your faithfulness, put an O God, save me by your name. And vindicate me by your life. O God, hear my prayer. Give ears to the words of my mouth. For strangers have risen against me. Ruthless men seek my life. They do not set God before themselves. For he has delivered me from every trouble. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the of my life. He will return the evil to my enemies.
the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Let your merciful ears, O Lord, be open to the prayers of your humble servants, and that they may obtain their petitions, make them to ask such things as shall please you, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament for the ninth Sunday of Trinity is written in 2 Samuel. With the merciful, you show yourself merciful. With the blameless man, you show yourself blameless. With the purified, you deal purely. And with the crooked, you make yourself seem torturous. You save a humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty to bring them down. For you are a lamp my Lord, and my God lightens my darkness. For by you I can run against a troop, and by my God I can leap over a wall. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock? except our God. This God is my strong refuge and has made my way blameless. He made my feet like the feet of a deer and set me secure on the heights. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is written in 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. Now these things took place as an example for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction, on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overcome you that is not common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. This is the word of the Lord. Gospel according to St. Luke, the 16th chapter. Jesus also said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do, since my master is taking the management away from me? I am not strong enough to dig. 
I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may re receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors, one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you've not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. This is the gospel of the Lord. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. Amen. The only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made who for us men, for our salvation, came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit, the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us in the flesh of God. He suffered in the grave. On the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and the name of the And the scriptures provide to him his father, and he will come again in glory to judge both the living and the dead.
grace to you and peace from God our Father, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is from the Gospel of St. Luke. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, sometimes when you hear this parable, it's a little confusing. What is Jesus trying to teach? My wife, like a lot of you, uh, sometimes was looked after by her grandmother. When she went to her grandmother's house, her grandmother would fix her food. And sometimes my wife didn't clean her plate. Never happened to any of you, I know. Now her grandmother wouldn't scold her. She would just say, as she took the plate, wasteful, wasteful. <laughs> That is what Jesus is teaching in this parable, to not waste your gifts, whether they are the gifts God has blessed you with here on earth, or whether they are the eternal gifts of everlasting life. No matter, you are managing God's gifts with his help, and we are called to be faithful in whatever God gives us. Now, you can waste all sorts of things. Money can be wasted, possessions, whatever. All of our temporal gifts can be wasted. And you might think, well, that's a really bad thing because they're limited, right? There is only so much land. Although there's a bunch of land, there is only so much. There is only so much money, despite how it seems to continue to increase but I don't know where it comes from. <laughs> there is only so much of limited commodities in this temporal world. And so to waste them is to do away with those things there's only so much of. In the parable, the manager, or sometimes the translation is steward, he is a manager of the rich man's possessions, and he is caught wasting them. And he is fired. And then he goes to the debtors of his boss, and he cuts deals with them in a clever scheme to befriend them so that they will take him in when he's put out on the street. Afterward, he is commended or praised by his boss for his shrewdness, his prudence, his quick thinking. He isn't forced to pay the remainder that he cheated his boss out of, and neither are the debtors. Both are forgiven. And he even is set up with a better employment in the future, getting a good reference to boot. Now when Jesus is teaching this, he is teaching us not to be wasteful, to be faithful in what we're given. He is in no way to be misunderstood in thinking that, oh, if you cut corners and you cheat and you lie to get ahead, God will praise you. Not at all. He is encouraging doing the right thing always. And he's also telling us to make friends. He literally says it. Make friends. And then when the unrighteous wealth fails, you have something else. The unrighteous wealth is the temporal gifts. In the Greek, when it says fails, it just means when it runs out, when your money runs out, when your, when your temporal goods wear out, when your property runs out. Then you have eternal wealth. Jesus rightly teaches us that money is limited compared to the eternal riches or glory of everlasting life in the resurrection of the dead that we just confessed. God has endless gifts. And we'll come back to that in the second part of the sermon. Concerning our temporal gifts, 1 Peter 4 tells us, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. All over the Bible, you will find God 
encouraging you to be faithful with what you have. So, if you are given something, do something with it. It's not just to be kept only for yourself, only for you. The steward, or the manager, is commended because he has an opportunity and he does something with it. He doesn't just roll over and die. He tries to get himself out of a jam. We need to understand this rightly. Jesus is not teaching works righteousness. As long as you think clever enough, as long as you try to do the right thing, oh, God will love you. Not at all. We'll come back to that. Certainly, we have nothing if it isn't from God. The entire management that he had was given from his rich master. The mercy or the debt that he tried to cancel was from his master. So Jesus' point is, if you are given something, do something with it. Solomon tells us in Ecclesiastes, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. If the sons of this world are going to put to work all of their resources to do evil or to get rich or to make the world a worse place, you, dear Christian, put your resources to work to love and serve others, to give glory to God. There are godless men in this world. There are sons of the world. You are striving for a real prize. You know the real goal. You always have Christ to fall back on. He will receive you into the eternal dwellings. Are you going to let someone who is motivated by money outdo you who are motivated by God? Are you going to let those who trust in things that fail overcome you who trust in God who never fails? If they are motivated by ill and find a way to work hard, Christians, you who have the Holy Spirit ought to work all the harder. Do something with whatever God has given you. The Bible shows us that wastefulness is not an option for those who believe in Christ. Christ always preaches us to do the right thing with what we are given. And then we fail. <laughs> we have wasted. We have times in our life when we look back and we didn't take the opportunity, jump when we should have, care for others when we know they were hurting, and then we have regret. Christ has died for your wastefulness. Christ has paid for those bad or selfish decisions you've made in the past. The scriptures guide us to do the right thing in the future. So, for example, if you tend to end up with a lot more food on the plate than you can eat, if your eyes are bigger than your stomach, as mine is sometimes, well, Take a little less food, whether it's for a diet or simply not to be wasteful with your food. If you struggle with how to spend your money, the scriptures will give you a guide. First and foremost, they say tithe. That is, in faith, entrust back to God 10% what he has given to you. Then care for those things that your neighbor needs, your family needs. And finally, you can use the last portion for those things that are on the wish list. If we don't make plans, if we don't set our priorities, we will get outmanaged by even the things of the world. If you don't manage your money, it will manage you. And the debtors that come and try and collect will not be as merciful as the rich man in the parable. So the Ten Commandments, actually, the law of God, helps guide us 
in managing all the blessings we have. Just think of them about for a second. The first commandment that teaches us not to have any other gods helps set our priority in God and trust all of our whole life in him. The commandments teach us how to use God's name, how to use God's word, how to submit to authority, how to bless and protect our human life and the sanctity of it. How to live as a male or a female, how to care for our possessions, how to speak about our neighbor, and how to be content with anything God gives us or doesn't give us. In a lot of ways, the law of God teaches us to manage or steward anything and everything in this world. It guides us so as not to be wasteful. Do you know the last person I heard talk to me about stewardship? This is going to surprise you. The last person I had talked to me about stewardship was a lawyer. And it's not because I was being sued. <laughs> it was because he was talking about how he is a steward of God's or of our nation's law. Yeah. Have you ever thought about that? We need good lawyers who will defend the innocent and prosecute the guilty. We need stewards of the law to have peace and order in society, including good judges and good police officers. We need people in society that tell the truth. And if that's true for something as simple as the law, it's true for everything in your life. Your property, your money, your family, your animals, or your time, your knowledge, your skill. If we waste them, it will come back to bite us. There are atheists and Muslims, Mormons, communists, pro-choice, pro-abortionists, all making use of their resources for ill. Christian, God is giving you resources, and he teaches you how to use them for good. Do it with all your might, for you are called to faithfully manage all temporal gifts. But God gives you eternal gifts, too. And Jesus teaches that in the parable afterwards when he says these axioms of truth. One who's faithful in very little will also be faithful in much, and one who's dishonest in little will be dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, that is, the temporal gifts, who will entrust you true riches, that is, eternal gifts? And if you've not been faithful in that which is another's, how will you be faithful in that which is your own? I'm tempted to think sometimes that the eternal gifts of God, it's not that big of a deal if I waste them. Like, for example, the gift of God's word. I mean, it's always there. Like, if you miss a sermon, you can catch another one next week. Or even go online and watch it there. If you miss a prayer today, well, you can fold your hands tomorrow. Sometimes we're tempted to think that because God has boundless and endless grace, it's not that big of a deal if we don't receive it right now. If it's wasted today, we can catch it tomorrow. But actually, it is the opposite. To lose out on God's eternal, endless, boundless gifts is far worse to waste the temporal gifts. These gifts are so valuable. They are the things that actually preserve and keep you. If we jip on God's word, his forgiveness, or his eternal life, on his sacraments for the forgiveness of sins, if we skip out on that, we're really jipping ourselves. Go back to the parable. What if it happened that the manager was fired and then the master didn't forgive him and actually prosecuted him 
for cutting the books and trying to rip him off and went to jail. Then the manager, <laughs> he'd be way out of luck. The rich man in the parable was merciful so that the manager got off scot-free and could do what he could do the rest of his life. I want you to think about that, Christian. Every day, you get off scot-free. Every day, you live in the total, boundless, endless mercy of God. Every day, God looks at you and smiles as his forgiven child. Yes, God's unconditional love is limitless. It's the steadfast love of the Lord. But why would we ever want to waste that? If we sin and think, no big deal, God will forgive me, not, not important at all, we cheapen God's grace. Yes, God's grace is free and endless, but it costs Christ. The mercy you receive, the unconditional love of the Lord, was bought and won, purchased by Jesus on the cross from blood pouring out of his body. Why would we ever skip on prayers or God's word, reading the, reading the Bible, or hear corporate worship? Why would we ever put off the assembly together where together, Christians, we hear the same gift poured out on all of us, sons of light? If you really believe God's word and his forgiveness, if you really believe his mercy is boundless, you never want to waste it. You never want to jip yourself of it. That's why you are here. You are here not because, uh, it'll come around again, and it was just convenient for you to catch it this morning. You are here because you really believe all of your life and all of your things come from God. You are here because you really believe the Word of God is the greatest gift. You are here because you are receiving that great gift now. Luther said, wherever the word of God is taught in truth and believed, it works. Wherever God's word is taught in truth and believed, it delivers what it says. You, Christian, are holding on to that word today. It's not like money. You can have a sure investment and think it's solid and it fails here in the world. But the word of the Lord that endures forever never returns void. The word of God will never fail you. Today, you approach the altar and you receive the very body and blood that Christ was crucified and risen to give you. That word will work faith in your life. It will not fail you. So that on the last day, when Christ returns, he ain't going to look at you and say, wasteful, wasteful. Because the word of the Lord has delivered on God's promises he will look at you and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
collect our offerings. As God is our good and gracious master, let us offer up our prayers for ourselves, the church, and the world, and all people in need. Merciful Father, you show mercy to us. Lead us to acknowledge your mercy with gratitude, that in turn we would be quick to show mercy to others. Give us a right understanding of our own weakness, and frailty to preserve us from fr from pride and lead us to cling to you for forgiveness lord in your mercy bless this congregation that we would not fall prey to grumbling adultery idolatry disbelief and other great shame and vice support your servants to preach the word steadfastly Bless Dr. Larry Wooster 
who is installed today as principal of St. Peter Lutheran School. And bless us, O Lord, in your truth. Lord, in your mercy, give us a right fear of you that we never abandon your word, a right love of you that we would fervently show mercy and thereby cover a multitude of sins. Give us a right trust of you that in repentance we return to our baptisms daily and in faith receive your very body and blood in this supper. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our uphold our nation and give us good government. Let those in authority not only be shrewd in their dealings, but act with love, righteousness, and devotion to the common good. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our hear our prayers for the sick and suffering. For Alice Harmon with RSV, for Kathy Meyer recovering from a head injury, for Carl, Callie, Sherry, Tiffany, Bernice, Zoe, Tim, Luella, Susie, Irene, Karen, Steve, Cleet, Jean, Craig, and Lily. Give them strength to endure their trials until you remove them. Lord, in your mercy, give us joy in our homes, that the elders and grandparents would be listened to, that husbands and wives would love one another selflessly as we celebrate all anniversary, including Dean and Karen Manuals, that fathers and mothers would be honored, including all mothers with child, and that children would be protected and nurtured in the Christian faith with daily prayer and weekly worship. Lord, in your mercy, into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary. We should, at all times and places, give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. We implore you of your mercy that you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Just a reminder, no adult Bible class or Sunday school this week. Uh, we'll start up next week, um, and all are invited to plan to attend. It'll be a, a good place to have a discussion and questions if you have any concerning uh, stewardship and being faithful with God's gifts. Um, no Bible class at Zion either this Tuesday. We uh, have a blessing to have the county fair so close to us here in Altamont, and blessings and safety for all those who are attending all the festivities this week. I do not believe we have, uh, we're entering our float in the parade. Am I wrong on that? So, if you're planning on marching, uh, well, plan on, uh, I guess, watching the parade, and maybe we'll see you there. Um, August calendars are updated as you walk through the narthex. There was just a couple of typos. So if you want uh, one without errors, <laughs> uh, you can grab one of those. Are there other announcements? We stand for the recessional. 